Hello and welcome to Agony Aunt and Uncle. If this is your first time visiting this podcast or indeed on video on uh, YouTube, we are we want you to think of us as an aunt and uncle. Yeah. Or we always say that have been even th- friends. Yeah. Who've been through some ups and downs in life. A few. Survived it A so few. far. Um, and so that's the kind of advice that we would give. We're not professional caregivers and we try really hard to not slip into giving advice. <laughs> it's really hard. But to sort of share our own experience and just our thoughts around whatever you've shared with us. And, and, and as, as we do every week, thank you so much for sharing such personal stories. We uh, This week, the, it's just blown mm. my mind, the, yeah. the letters that have come in. And if you don't hear your letter today and if you've sent over the last few days, you will do because I really want to try and do all of them because mm. they just squeeze my heart. Very powerful. And obviously we have to get, get a good mixture in each podcast of different sorts of problems. Um, right, <clears throat> so I'm going to kick off. Um, so I don't usually read out compliments to us, but it's just I think it's relevant for what then this person goes on to say. Who You have put your name, but I'm going to keep you anonymous just in case. Uh, firstly, thank you for your podcast and YouTube channel. Coming from a family whom I greatly adore that does not talk about emotions and difficult things openly, it is refreshing and cathartic to listen to you deal with the difficult stuff of life and so often with great insight and deep compassion and humour. So thank you so much, because mm. that is what we are going for, and that, that really is lovely. And the, the, as I say, the reason I've read that out is because, because of the fact that you don't feel like you can have these open chats with your family. So here we are, Agni, Art and Uncle. My question is about emotional sobriety. Mm. I am currently in week five of changing my relationship with food, specifically a sugar addiction. Now, I don't have added sugar as a crux. I'm beginning to question what it is covering up. I suppose on a base level, I've always known I emotionally binged. And we are talking heinously large, family-sized packets of chocolate, sweets, biscuits, desserts, etc. This began when I could first walk to school by myself, same with me, that's when I started buying lots of packets of crisps, and passed the news agents, and only got worse at secondary school. The quantities increased. By sixth form, I was barely existing and lived for getting home and binging sweet foods and telly-numbing myself into a few hours of oblivion. I love that saying, telly-numbing. Mm. That really resonated mm. with me. To put it shortly, this only got worse at uni, and although I had sporadic moments of getting healthy, they always failed and I reverted to my secretive binging ways once again. I was diagnosed with social anxiety at 18. The psychiatrist explained this had fueled periods of depression in my life. But the last few years, my anxiety hasn't stopped me from going outside, doing new things. I feel the fear and do it anyway, as they say. Well, good for you, because that's so hard. I suppose I fell into the trap of thinking we can simply get over mental health issues rather than accept they will always be there and they must be managed and attended to, even when we feel okay or good. So how do we deal with our shit in a healthy way when suddenly the crux we had is no longer there? And how do we deal with the influx of difficult emotions we didn't even realise we'd been sitting on? Well, this is, I mean, this is really something that both Mark and I can share our experiences with you. And hopefully you get something with it. And of course, you know, as those of you who are regular watchers um, will know, Mark went to rehab, what, 20, 20 years ago? No, 18. 18 years ago. Yeah. 18 years sober. Nearly 19. And um, I, because of that did spend a while going to, going to Overeaters Anonymous, so we've both got experience in this. But Mark is definitely the, um, well, the better I mean, one. Well, in a weird way, it's, both, it's very much both of us, because, mm. I mean, it's food, and, you know, something that me and Nadia have discovered over the years, um, less obviously for me, because it was sort of hidden behind alcohol and drugs and relationships and all that kind of stuff, is an addiction, is our, our food issues. But, I mean, obviously, the the 
aspect of this that really pings out, obviously, firstly, well done, currently in week five, of changing your relationship with food. No easy task changing your relationship with anything that one eats, consumes, or does, in, in, and has historically done in a compulsive fashion to fix, solve, or take the edge off the difficulty of feelings. Um, and you talk about emotional sobriety, um, and what you're talking about here is an age-old phrase, uh, sort of maxim that they say in a lot of 12-step uh, recovery fellowships, where they say, you know, the great thing about getting sober is you get your feelings back. The terrible thing about getting sober is you get your feelings back, because mm. you begin to realise how much you've been leaning on whatever the activity, substance, whatever the thing is you do, whatever it is that you've become dependent on, you've, you know, it's to weird, meditate. isn't it fascinating? Yeah, mm. the body and the mind has done this, not for just, as some would have you think, oh, irresponsible, you know, greedy, doesn't have a know when to stop, doesn't, you know, I mean, that, don't get me wrong, that creeps into, into all people's behaviour in all ways at some point. But isn't it interesting that unfortunately we, as a survival mechanism, we, we find a way of kind of managing really difficult feelings and difficult emotions through, through things like food and alcohol and what have you. This is really weird because reading this, I'm not entirely sure, you might have read my post that I posted last night on Instagram. Um, and that was talking about the inability to kind of, or the frustration and the struggle, which again is about the kind of, you know, feeling emotions, not feeling emotions, the joy, the, the horror, the pain, the... the the, you know, the spiritual freedom of feeling your emotions, but the absolute bloody nightmare of feeling your feelings. Um, an inability to escape self and an, an inability to get away from me. And I think, you know, something that is a huge part of so many things we do, especially around food, especially around drink, uh, you know, is we're trying to, we're trying to escape us. It's like, it's the ultimate sort of staycation form of a geographical. Often when people talk about geographicals, you go around the world to escape yourself, but of course you don't. You land and you're there and with all the same problems. But I think I, I, I'm trying to repurpose this term geographicals that we're, I, I'd like to just escape myself to there <laughs> and get out of my head. And I think what you're finding here is you're asking a question on how do you live life when you've removed that thing that made being you, it fraudulently made being you feel more manageable. And that's no easy thing. I mean, this, this is, you know, they often talk about having a toolkit and in that toolkit of kind of recovery, um, there are so many different things. And there are, sometimes there's a danger that those things in that toolkit can become a little bit too prescriptive and that there are rules and that they should be this and there should be that. And so nothing I'm about to say is like, you should do this or you should do that. But I do think if you've got to week five, you're doing incredibly well. And I think you need to, one of the things I struggle with is, is not, of course we want to measure things in terms of time. It's a huge achievement. You get chips, you get sobriety chips, you get people are posting all over social media. I've got, and it's really important. But the most important aspect of every sort of time check is that it's just for that day. I'm no more sober today than someone who's been sober for a week, today. I might have used a whole host of kind of different strategies and things to stay sober for longer, and it might be a, more difficult for that person. But today, I, you've stayed sober, and I think it's really important that there's no value judgment around that. So in terms of your relationship with food, I think you have to keep focusing on what you've achieved and what you've done and what you've accomplished. Um, but in terms of when you remove that crux and how do you deal with difficult emotions, there's no, I'm not going to lie, there's no straight nor easy answer to that. It, it's going to be a range of... Um, potentially, you know, um, being in self-help groups, um, finding both structure to your time, structure to your day, um, but not too much structure. Because for some people, too much structure becomes the very thing that makes you feel very ill and very un unwell and very sort of stressed and anxious. What do you do? I use um, exercise a lot. I mean, I cross addict massively to doing lots of working and, and uh, you know, editing this, writing this, editing that, shooting this, whatever. I'm always kind of pivoting around other stuff that means that one doesn't have to sort of almost look at one's own emotions. And that's an important uh, thing to note because you can cross addict. Totally, you? totally it's cross addict. Yeah. So, you know, in many regards, a lot of what we try to put, I mean, thank you for your calm words at the beginning, across all of our platforms is about trying to share, um, you know, 
sharing the unanswerability of things is all right. I think there's sometimes a real dilemma and difficulty that we think there's an answer or some kind of defined kind of solution. And often there isn't. It's about being but trying to be in a kind of place yourself. Now, all of this I'm saying, Nadia inside will be roaring with laughter because I can't do any of this with myself. I mean, you know, insofar as what can I offer when someone says this to me, if you were my daughter, if someone was saying this to me, I'd be like, these are the things you need to aim to do. I don't succeed, but I know that when I, I do protect exercise time, when I do allow myself not to be buffeted by the demands of we need to get that out or that delivered or this thing or got to, you know, the, the difficulty is how do you do that? And I think reaching out and sharing with, with like-minded people, talking to other people who've struggled with their food is a good idea. So sorry, I've banged on for too long. But, no, you um, haven't banged yeah, on. No, no. You so, haven't banged I mean, on at all. It's all really I mean, I think it's probably better for you, Nadia. I'm not really offering any tangible kind of solutions other than you will, as you, I suppose the best thing I can say is just finally, is as you hit upon something that works for you, Try and have mindfulness over how it works for you. I'm trying to do that at the moment, where I'm trying to reconfigure myself, my responses to things, not successfully, but I'm trying to reposition re myself so that I don't see everything asked or coming in as some kind of threat or stress or anxiety-inducing episode that actually nothing's as, as speedily rushed and needed to be sorted as it is ever. I mean, nothing, nothing in life, unless you're an emergency, uh, an ambulance driver or a policeman or whatever, you know, and obviously there are many sort of like technical reasons when things have to be done quickly. But the vast majority of things that cause us enormous distress mentally and emotionally come about, and you say that you've been diagnosed with um, anxiety, come about because of a self-created urgency a cataclysmic kind of, <gasps> and it's about just trying to check how many times you do that. I mean, I could talk for ages. I'm doing a lot of work in my therapy about the word hunger and food, um, but that's a whole other whole other chat. But, um, but yeah, I, I would say that as you hit upon things, take time, don't be rushed. And as things come to you, like it might be the, I don't know, you find that going for a walk in a certain park really works for you. You know, do it more. Do it. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds... Doesn't sound ridiculous. It's like it's like you say, people want huge, big answers, but yeah, sometimes the answer is in the little things. Mm. So, um, first of all, amazing that you feel the fear and do it anyway. And mm. I think I really agree with Mark on that. That don't try and look too far ahead. Stay in today as much as you can. But I have to say, when Mark is in his white knuckling moments, white knuckling means just trying to get through and not using any of the tools that he's been given he could quite easily throttle me when i say that <laughs> but i mean obviously i've learned a lot from the tools that mark got in rehab but also what i got from going to overeaters anonymous so i don't want to talk too much about overeaters anonymous because i have mentioned it in other podcasts and it feels like you're a regular listener so you've probably heard me on that but i can just give you some just headline top tips this is just for dealing with the food. Now, Mark, in, in, with alcohol addiction, they'll say, first thought, second thought. First thought is, oh, wow, I'm going to get, I, I want to drink. I just want to drink. I, I'm sorry, it's just, what am I doing? Why am I not drinking? Why can't I just have a couple of drinks and, you know, kick back and have a good time with everybody? Second thought is, because where that will end is probably me losing my keys, losing my wallet, spending all my money, you know, getting home, having an argument, relationship breaking up. So what will be, what will come next? And you can have that with food. You you know, five weeks without sugar is incredibly difficult, mm. even for people that aren't sugar addicts, mm. because sugar is everywhere. So first of all, give yourself a huge pat on the back every day that you that you're doing that. And every when you, hour. if you want to reach for the sugar, ask yourself what is going on for you emotionally. So just give yourself a break, a one minute. So I'm going to have this chocolate, that compulsive reach for the chocolate, and then say, am I angry? Did I need to have that argument with my friend that I didn't have? Am I lonely? Do I need to pick up the phone and talk to somebody else? Am I tired? Am I Meaning, am I looking after enough for myself? Am I getting enough sleep? Have I eaten properly? Because if you haven't eaten something 
that is um, uh, nutrient dense, something that's good for you, you will reach for sugar. I see Mark do it all the time. Mm. He won't eat mm. all day and then he wants a whole massive bar of chocolate to fill in quickly because he's starving. He's literally starving. So have I, have I fed myself properly? Like, so I haven't let my blood sugar drop like through the day. Did I have a good breakfast? Did I have a good lunch? Did I have a good dinner? I think it's a really, I hate doing this, but for some people it really, really works to actually write out what you're going to eat for the day. And I initially did that when I went to Overseas, it, Every It's Anonymous, to just try and get me back on track. And, um, and just, just take it one day at a time or even one hour at a time. But check in with how was I feeling when I went to the sugar? What was going on here? Because the sugar is just a drug. It's just Valium. It's just, it's just numbing. It's like putting yourself in the freezer. I don't want to feel this. And then whatever that is, feel it. Sit with it. And say to yourself, I would prefer it if this feeling wasn't here because you never say, I don't want this feeling because it will come back. And say, but I know it will pass because the only thing that is constant in life is change. And just and so, as the a, little things I use on a daily basis. And just as a final little addendum to that, I would say, you know, th there's a lot said and written about food journals and keeping notes of what you've written and da 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 da. It's very easy with. I smart. actually hate it because it makes me obsessive, but a lot of people it works. But I would also argue that perhaps as much, I mean, and by and large, not always, a lot of those food journals about what you've eaten and at what time, I, I would say make a note of what's going on at the point that you feel an urge mm, to kind of have something. You know, diary. for me, if I really interrogate it, there's a listlessness that creeps into me around about 11 o'clock where there's a dissatisfaction about one thing, the day's ending, and so, you know, why does it happen at a certain time? You might not get all the answers that you want. Also, I just noticed just quickly as we, as we finish up on this, it says, I'm beginning to question what it was covering up. Only when I stopped drinking, and it's been a long process over many years, have I discovered, or do I now know from the position I'm in, that with diagnoses of things like ADHD, but more significantly bipolar, that you know you you may well discover that there are other mental mm. health neurodiverse issues around that will make sense of things yeah. and will allow you to feel a bit more compassionate about the if, choices you've made. It's a possibility. If, like that's what I've discovered about myself. Uh, mm. and both of us have. Um, but meanwhile, well done you. Yeah, Keep well done. taking it one day at a time. Think about an overeat and honest. And this Saturday on the Curly Cooks, Dina and I are doing gut health. Oh, right. Gut health is so important for your brain, for your for depression, for anxiety, and of course, for maintaining a weight and, and feeding yourself properly so you're not reaching for those quick things. So I think this week's Curly Cooks will be a really good one for you, 10 o'clock live on Saturday. Okay. So, so oh, what, what month are we in? We should probably say July the something, in case people are listening okay, to this. Okay, so I'll read this one, Mads. This yeah. is, uh, I'm, this is, again, anonymous. Um, I'm 45 in a very unhappy relationship, mm. which is pretty much over bar the final goodbye. My kids are adults and off living their lives. I have no close family, no place of my own to call home because of debt. I'm a teacher and I know I'm valued at work, but that's mm. the only place I feel any kind of importance. Life feels like it's completely over. The thought of trying to meet anyone and start again is petrifying and, it's honest, and I honestly can't think who would want me. I have nothing to offer. I spend my days in front of others pretending I have my shit all figured out. Everyone thinks I'm strong and independent when in reality I feel like I'm drowning. How do I come to terms with this being it? Oh God. God, this really made me. This actually an broke. enormous hug. This actually really broke my heart and I really, really... Mm. Um, it really resonated with me because around that age, and obviously I don't know what's going on in your relationship or anything like that, but I'm just going to talk about the feelings that I hear here and the feelings that I connect with. Around that age, I was perimenopausal, not saying you are, mm -hmm. not saying you are at all, I don't know and I'm not a doctor in any way, but those feelings of who am I, where am I, mm -hmm. what is my purpose, what is my truth? Am I just a completely fake person? What, what, what's been the point of all of it? Mm. Still doing loose women, loose women, still going out there faking to make it. When I look back now, I see how often I had brain fog and stumbling mm. over my words and unable to finish a sentence and obviously exacerbated with my ADHD. Menopause is much, much, can be much more difficult for people with ADHD. Um, 
feelings of the most terrible health anxiety, like every symptom I had, I thought I was dying and bleeding so so badly, um, tense, like itching, feelings of loss, brain fog. It was a really, really dark and scary time for me, actually. So what I would say to you firstly is just really look into that. Could this be perimenopause, perimenopause for you? Um, and and I, I, I would recommend that you go to the Louise Newson uh, Menopause Doctors website and have a read through that and see if anything chimes. There are dozens and dozens of symptoms that come along with menopause. And if this is menopause related, you need to be really armed when you go into a doctor uh, with, with what your rights are. So that's why I had to say all that first, just in case a lot of this could be attached to that. Mm. It might not be. You might not be suffering any menopause symptoms. It might not be. It might just be that you've got to that point in your life and you're pretty knackered, kids are off, and you're just going, what the but what shines out to me here is, and where I do think you can root your feet into the ground as the foundation for the next part of your life, I am a teacher and I am valued. That is incredibly powerful because there are so many people that have nowhere where they're valued. Now, I'm not saying, oh, you should be grateful because there's people that aren't valued. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this could be your superpower. This could drive you forward into the next part of your life. Like, where you are teaching, is it the right place for you teaching? Have you always had a dream to teach in a different way, with a different kind of person, in a different group, a different country? You know, 45, if you start to think of it, as my kids have grown up, I think you've said that you've left your a very unhappy relationship. You know, maybe you're gonna leave this relationship Maybe that, we so often will think I haven't got the strength to leave because we're using every bit of strength to stay. So who knows, you might leave this relationship and a lot of these feelings will just go out the window because this person could be pulling you down. Um, and if you try and think of this period in your life as not the beginning of the end, but the beginning of it being our time as women, I read this article a few years back when it was talking about how men get... One of the reasons men get really petrified around menopause is that what happens is because your oestrogen levels drop, which is the hormone that, that will that gives us that, that often that, that caring part of ourselves because it drops. I always say, I knew there was something wrong one day when, when the family, Mark and the girls and everyone said, uh, oh, I'm starving. Pre-menopause, I would have gone, oh, what does everybody want? And I'll make a pile of sandwiches. And now I, I came out of my mouth, well, why don't you all have a sandwich? And it was like, huh? <laughs> What's that? And I was kind of frightened by it. God, have I become a selfish... No, no, it is the time where you've done a lot of your nurturing and now you can start nurturing yourself. What do you actually want? You know, I say this to friends of mine when I say, if you don't know what you want, you, how can you ask for it? So is what you want the dream of, is the dream in there somewhere that you leave this partner? But what pulls you back is the fear of being on your own. How can you strengthen that? Who can you talk to? Who can validate you? I've just validated you massively by saying you have a really important job where you feel valued. And I feel that could be the place, that could be the soil from which you grow into the next part of your life. Um... Oh, everyone thinks I'm so strong and independent, you say, because you're faking it to make it, which is a really powerful thing to have, but sometimes it can really deplete us because we're just faking it all the time. But where could you, like, target that? Like, if you're doing it for everybody, you're wasting your strength and your power. If you're doing it every day for the partner that you're unhappy with, if you're faking it to make it there, take that back. Don't use it there. Use it for where, I don't know, I'm just... Say that you've always wanted to work with in, in a particular school and you don't really have the, 
confidence for it. That would be a place to fake it and make it because it's going to push you further on towards what you want, right? But faking it to make it for toxic people or toxic situations is taking too much of your female power, too much of your energy, too much of your strength. Life is is completely, it feels like it's completely over. That's because you're using too much of your life to stay where you're unhappy. So either decide that you're going to be proactive in making this relationship more the way you want it. You're never going to make it perfect, but pain you make it better. But if it is really toxic and really making you unhappy, think of a way and exit. I don't know if it's a violent relationship. I don't know anything about it. If it is, do not just pack your bags and walk out one day. It's really important that you contact somewhere like Refuge or something like that to get advice. I feel like I'm drowning. How do I come to terms with this being it? Do not come to terms with this being it because it is not it. Do not come to terms with it. Do not sit down, go to a coffee shop, take time just for you, order a bloody latte with extra caramel sauce, whatever it is, take a moment. And I would say, none of this can happen suddenly apart from checking out whether you could be perimenopausal. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. But take it every day, like for the next week, do something small and powerful that is just for you. Just for you, just something, just those small sparks of joy, try and find them. You know, just, just whatever they are. What you, what, Mark, give me a spark of joy. Just something really small that is just too, too on the spot for me. Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. So a spark of joy for me might be, um, I don't know, just just like a, a top that I haven't worn for ages that I really like, and I just have a feel of it, and I might try and get a memory of when I felt good in it. Just like small sparks of joy. I'm sure for Mark it would be like a memory of like the cinema with his kids or when he was young. Just start bringing in those those good feelings and thoughts bit by bit. Um. Yeah, I mean, I can disagree with anything that, that Nadia says. I just uh, sort of chime in at the end here. Um, my take on this, reading this paragraph, and I've read it about five times whilst Nadia was talking, is a distinct sense of claustrophobia, a distinct sense of there are no choices. Um, because you talk about debt, because you talk about, um, you know, the end of a relationship, you also talk about your kids having grown up, they, they've moved off, etc. So it's the sense of all the lack of possibilities is what I'm mm. feeling here. And I know I, no one knows only too well how that feels, that sense of you can't see the options, you can't see the opportunities. So quite interestingly, when Nadia threw to me then and said, What's your, I, I'm not in a, a mental headspace where I can just clutch at a, a, a spark of joy, which is a really important thing to do. And what I think is important about that is that even at that point I couldn't do it is there'll be, t it's very hard to do. If you're not in a position to be able to see things in that way, it's quite hard to do. What I would say, which I think Nadia's kind of indicated is I think you're gonna, looking at the limitations of how you're feeling and there's a sense of claustrophobia, feeling like you're drowning. One statement of fact we can give you, and Nadia has already, is this is not it. It's Nothing the is it. Of the next so phase. park that to one side and don't have that. The strength you've got is you're clearly highly regarded, highly respected in your work. You've got people who are you say would be surprised because they find you strong and independent. My my advice there would be obviously there are people there. The, the, where are the green shoots? Where are the little little green buds that you could you could pluck out and grow and nurture? is one of some of them, someone in that group who uh, believe that you're strong and independent will be approachable and will be um, someone that you could reach out to and actually reveal in a sense, not massively, but touch with them mm. and say, look, do you know what? I'm not feeling this. I'll try and facilitate maybe some way of seeing them for a coffee, seeing them for a chat, seeing them at work, doing something where one of these people who thinks you're so strong and independent can get a, a, a sense of actually, you know, you're struggling a bit behind the scenes. There's, you know, you need to connect, you're overwhelmed. And you'll be surprised how everyone is overwhelmed at different times in different ways. You're in an unhappy relationship, which you say is over bar the final goodbye. Your kids are grown up. Let's look at the, okay, you know, it's never positive, is it, for any kids at any age? But let's try and look at the positive of that. So you haven't got young kids that is, makes it really complicated for you to kind of upset the apple cart. You re I realise you've got limited choices in terms of feeling like you can get out. You've got nothing to lose, so long as, going back to Nadia, it's not a violent relationship, a control, you know, co co controlling relationship. Hopefully, you've got nothing to lose from actually flagging some of this up with your partner and exploring how you could, at the very least, 
between the two of you try and make things better or more agreeable or less dark <clears throat> at home. It's about finding those little moments, those little spaces. You're a good teacher. You feel valued at work. Maybe there's something you can do. I can think of people who've done this where there's some part of what you teach and how you teach that you really love and you could perhaps set up a, an after school class. I mean, I'm not suggesting you do more work because teachers are overworked all the bloody time. But is there any way you can pivot what you're good at towards something that also feeds you? and makes you feel, you know, feel like you've got a bit more self-esteem. But I really, and sometimes it's just really important to say, when I read or hear this kind of thing, and often in a 12-step program, like you're in a meeting and you hear someone say something, I, get, I hear you, you feel, it feels shit, and, and that's okay too, but I can promise you, it's not it. You're 45, you're young, you've got everything ahead of you. And if I can just say one last thing, you say here, the thought of trying to meet anyone, start again, is petrifying. And it's on, I honestly can't think who would want me. Please, please don't have this thought at the moment about how you could meet somebody else. Mm. Because in a way, you are, you are self-sabotaging. Because when you are unhappy in a relationship, the thought of another relationship is impossible. And that's what's maybe stopping you from thinking that you can even have any change because you're, you're attaching it to having somebody else. Who knows? You might find somebody in the future. You might find that you never want anyone else in the future. You don't know. But don't attach this part of your life and this life change to having a partner or not. Um, because I think that it might be what's what you're doing to, to stop yourself from taking the next step. And also, finally, just to say, I mean, it's always useful to interrogate yourself. Okay, an unhappy relationship. It's not. It, it does take two, unfortunately, to tango in those scenarios. You know, maybe your partner, maybe you're presenting. You know, maybe you're pursuing a certain type of perfection in all areas. The fact that others would be surprised to find that you are feeling vulnerable or down maybe suggests to me that you are very, very good at faking it to make it and putting out this exterior and maybe that exterior that you put out is so effective that your partner has stepped back a little bit and could be more useful if you were able to sort of show some of that vulnerability these are just thoughts without knowing because of course the, the we don't know you details. could be in a very coercive yeah, yeah, that we don't know we're just posing different scenarios and the other aspect that i would which is always worth doing is doing a sort of inventory or audit on what is your behavior around other things in terms of how you're coping uh, do, you, do you feel more like this when you've drunk more, when you're late at night, at the beginning of a day, are you waking up like this? Just are you, do you food, you've just talked about food issues with the, with the first dilemma. It, interrogate how you're coping because what you might find is, is the things that you think are helping you cope or making it bearable or survivable or whatever are actually the things that are aggravating things even more, which is often the case. There'll be some behavioral thing going on which often is a, about aggravating the issue and we think it's to try and numb the issue. So there might be that, uh, that element too as well. I mean, I wouldn't know unless we were sort of sat, sat with you talking to you. But wow, thank you so much, everybody yeah, really that has, that's, that's um, sent Reached in your, your, your problems. And you know, like in 12-step um, in programs, they say, try and look for the similarities and not the differences. Mm. So it's you can be listening to a problem of somebody else thinking, well, that's not my life. But there might be something in there as well that you go, oh, blimey. Because I, I get this from just from reading your letters. It, it just constantly makes me think about myself as in a relationship where I still go wrong all the time. So it is sharing back and forth. So. And a final little tip that I think I find really useful, and I did it a couple of weeks ago, and it, was, it really helped me. Okay, I was seeing a therapist about it afterwards, but send yourself a text. Sometimes if you send right a text as if you're telling someone, like you've done here, you've sent us this message, write a more detailed one and send it to yourself because sometimes it really helps when you write stuff down and you reread it back, mm. you go, Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm feeling that a lot more than that. Or maybe, yeah. uh, what, maybe what, that's what comes about. out first when you say, I feel life is over. What's number yeah, yeah, yeah. one? Yeah. Is that because of your relationship? Is yeah. that because of this? Is that because of that? Sometimes quite useful. We can't ask for what we want if we don't know what it is. <laughs> Top Thanks line, ever man. so much, guys. Lots and lots of love. Until next time. <laughs>